We're joined now by Dr. Walter Coyle. He is a moderator of the ASGE Symposium entitled Controversies in Training, Advanced Endoscopic Training. Doctor, thank you very much for being here, first of all. Thank you, Todd. Uh, so what are the biggest controversies in endoscopic training right now? Well, we're going to focus mostly on advanced training in endoscopy, although all levels of endoscopy have problems with how we're doing our training. We've often been apprentice model, where you just do a lot of different things, and at the end you get signed off. And we're trying to get away from that, where it's sheer volume, we want to get quality. So we're trying to balance outcomes and success of procedures and uh, training with skills versus just doing sheer numbers and saying because you did 500 colonoscopies or 300 endoscopic ultrasounds, you're set to go. Right. And that's been a problem. How, how has it been a problem? Well, some places, uh, there's variability in the training programs and the number of, you, of procedures you get, how much hands-on the trainee actually gets. So if the trainee gets in trouble, the staff then takes the scope away and finishes the procedure. Mm -hmm. If that happens almost every time, then when that person's out in the training and doing it on their own, they have no one to support them. And so we want to get away from that. So one of the models that the British Society has come up with that I like is like for ERCP, endoscopic retrograde contrapancatography, was where they say 300 is the number, minimum, and the last 50, you're assessed for what your cannulation rate is. So you need to get in by yourself with no assistance 80% of the time for the last 50. I think that's a model we all need to move to, where it's not just, yes, you have a minimum number of procedures you did, but now you can get in on your own, you don't need to have the scope taken away, and you're safe, and your outcomes are very reliable and followed. Kind of more stringent guidelines in a yes. sense? Yes, yes. Um, any other way they need to be changed or, or addressed as far as, as new procedures, new ways of measuring? Well, that goes into two things, training and then people who are advanced endoscopists who want to learn a new skill. Right. So, and that's a problem. Because in the past, you would say, oh, you just see it and you just go home and do it yourself for the first time on a patient, which sometimes worked well, but otherwise can be very difficult. So now the different societies have different programs. You go in for a weekend where there's cognitive knowledge, there's a skill set, you're evaluated by faculty, and then you go back and do the procedure for the first time. And I think that's a move we're doing, and we're doing that with seasoned endoscopists, and we're doing that same model we're trying to get through with our trainees. So what role do you think simulators will play in advanced endoscopy training? Well, I wish there was more of a role. We've been trying to get them in, and there's two problems with simulators. One is, a lot of them are high cost, especially mm -hmm. if you're using the virtual ones. And then if you're using an animal model, like a live pig, where it's as very similar to a human, that's very expensive and there's ethical concerns. So we're trying to find other models that aren't expensive, that are, are very reliably good for training. And we don't really have them yet, we're working on it. One of the things I think is very uh, exciting is 3D printing. We're looking, there's a mechanical models where you actually would print out a pancreas, a liver, and the bile duct system, and then you can do that over and over again and use that for training fellows. There was a paper last year at DDW on that, and uh, I think that's really been an area we wide open. Because then you really could do practice on 25 or 30 you know, virtual models or these mechanical models 3D printing before you go to your first person. In the studies they've done it in colonoscopy, it made you better initially, but then you caught up if you didn't do the training. And in a small study of the ERCP, it did seem to improve cannulation rate uh, early on. So I think these are things we need to look into, and then if it's very effective, we should try to disseminate among all the programs. All right, very good. Dr. Walter Coyle, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Okay.